Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk a bit more about post-war Japanese culture and more the quote-unquote kind of cultural side of it, or at least a specific kind of type um, of Japanese culture, almost kind of a quasi-counterculture if you will. This video might be a little bit shorter than other ones, but I have a bunch of fun links on Moodle for you that I want you to go and look at, and the discussion question at the end of the video will pertain directly to those particular videos. First of all, there's just some broad kind of, you know, overlying elements, and I talked a bit about these in previous videos, to understand when you're looking at um, Japanese kind of culture, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and, and kind of popular culture and urban culture and everything else. One is that there's this, this, this notable rise of the middle class, and there's kind of the, the old, old and new middle class ideas that Gordon's book has been talking about and floating around for several chapters now. These ideas are kind of still present. You know, you have the salary man, you have, um, so you have people working on factory floors, you have shopkeepers, you have the salary man, you have graphic designers and starting to come in. All these kinds of new kinds of jobs are coming in and new kinds of ideas. And, and with that, you have this massive growth in corporate culture and alongside it, you know, a specific social context of that. So for example, I remember many years ago um, having Japanese friends while living in East Asia and they would tell me, oh yeah, college is, nobody cares about college. College is just, college is your time off before you start living. So college is your chance to have a crazy haircut and just kind of hang out and sleep late and drink with your friends and have fun because once you get out of college, you've got to kind of take on these much more restrictive kind of, you know, social expectations of you. And I always I always took that with a grain of salt because any, you know, it's like me telling you about Irish people, right? I'm going to give you one, I'm going to generalize a little bit and kind of give you what I, you know, I'm going to give you these defining characteristics of what being Irish means, but I'm also going to give you my defining characteristics of what being Irish means. And you can find another Irish person with very different ideas about that. So the same is true of Japan. But certainly in kind of the public Japanese discourse, there was kind of this understanding of that, that there was a kind of an extent of, uh, of accepting a constrained life for the vast majority of Japanese, unless you got to be an artist or something. And, and I think this is something that you see in Western culture quite a lot as well. But in Japan, to gone, I suppose, certain kinds of characteristics. Um, there's also a significant changing role for women in society. Now, there's many ways in which Japan, which many other societies have as well, has a long way to go in terms of thinking about uh, female roles in society. But continuing a long track over the previous century, really, of women coming ever more further into kind of the public sphere and being part of kind of public life and being seen certainly as leaders in the cultural sphere, um, if not always in the political sphere, not often the political sphere. You know, these things are happening in post-war Japanese society. Very important decision, for example, is a 1966 Sumitomo Cement um, court case decision, which made it illegal to fire women because they got married up until 1966. Not only was it legal to fire women because she got married, it was in, it was considered completely normal. It was, it was part of legal codes. And after 66, it's no longer the case. Now, Sadly, this doesn't magically fix things for female workers in Japanese corporations overnight, but it's an important kind of move in Japanese legislation. That's an example of an extent which things are being freed up. You know, in the last video, I, I, I suppose I was trying to kind of evoke, there's a certain amount of tension here between a supposedly conservative kind of wing of Japanese society and a more kind of a liberal wing of Japanese society. But what I think the last video showed is, it's very hard to sketch Japanese society out that simply into those two camps. It just doesn't work. There's just there's just too much going on, right? And so in that video, I kind of list lots of stuff that's happening. There's too much going on. Um, but certainly kind of the Japanese experience begins to become dominated by very specific characteristics, such as, for example, urbanization. And outside of Japan, you know, we're looking in on it for myself as a young Irish boy, really, and then man, um, seeing Japan as being defined by specific characteristics, such as, for example, consumer electronics. Sony, which had been founded in 1946, gets permission to start working on specific types of transistors in 1953, invents the Sony Walkman in 1978. Now, you guys probably know what the Walkman is, maybe from the Guardians of the Galaxy movie or something like that, but the Walkman was the coolest thing imaginable when I was a teenager. And not only was the coolest thing imaginable, but everybody had a Walkman, basically. Everybody that could afford a Walkman had a Walkman. You're listening to music on the go, on the way to the bus, you name it. This was a Japanese thing. Not only was it a Japanese invention, but the Japanese made the only ones that were even only half decent. You would have, maybe some of you never heard of this before. When I was a very small boy in the early 80s, you know, my grandfather had one of these kind of things, it had a handle and there was a, ta there was a tape deck and then a big old speaker, all part of this one thing. And it was just, you know, it was terrible, it was a stupid, terrible thing. The Sony Walkman actually worked, right? You put the headphones on, you're listening to your own music. Um, it was super high tech, it had fast forward buttons. Um, you know, in the 1990s, they added these different kinds of programming you could do, all kinds of amazing things. 
to the Sony Walkman and, and, and the Sony was a Japanese thing. The Nintendo Entertainment System produced in 1983 and introduced into the American market a couple of years later, um, you know, helps to kind of um, solidify Japan as the home of like technology, of super high tech technology. So for Westerners looking in, Japan is like, oh, Japan's the future. And and within Japan, um, you know, it, it creates a very different kind of element for young Japanese growing up. Um, you know, their parents built these structures and now they live among them and kind of take them, well, take them for granted, I guess the older people would say, but kind of grow up with this and develop it further. It can be very difficult actually to separate the reality of Japanese popular culture and kind of Western perceptions. Um, of Japanese popular culture. For example, the otaku concept, right? An otaku is someone who, uh, usually male, but not exclusively, who's really, really into very specific, you know, um, interests, which are usually like manga or anime or video games or something. He's like, you know, a nerd kind of thing, but a kind of a, a shut-in, a nerd shut-in. Now, that's... I'm taking on language of a specific type of conservative Japanese who doesn't like otaku and thinks they're socially destructive. They don't... Not everyone thinks about otaku that way. But in the West, you know, you'll have, you know, Western people who almost like self-identify as otaku. Um, but in Japan, there's a different kind of concept to it. So, for example, being really into manga, into Japanese comics, is not... 20 years ago was not the weird thing that it kind of was in the West. Or in the West, comics were seen as childish things. Um, in, in the 80s, for example. Comics were seen as childish things. Video games were seen as childish things. And in, in Japan, it had always been more acceptable for adults to participate in this kind of an idea. Look where we are in 2020. All our major films are based on comic books and video games are much more popular. But in the 80s and 90s, this was kind of a divide between Japan and the West. And also this sense in the West that Japan had been westernized um, in their culture. And I, I don't know. I, I think that... Um, I always feel uncomfortable about that. Like, so you you often see references to manga for this because there's a kind of a certain type of uh, manga artwork that seems to westernize its characters and make them look more like Americans or more like white people. And although in some cases this is true, there's a broader kind of aesthetic movement in Japanese art or Japanese popular art, manga art, um, that needs to be understood not so much as a westernizing kind of idea as a kind of a reduction of kind of characteristics kind of an idea so the white person becomes a blank canvas in this kind of a way and then the flip side of it is you know the japanese elements of japanese culture become you know uh almost um oh become a kind of almost a western fetish so for example harajuku culture harajuku is this um is this district in tokyo it's very famous for very kind of aggressive and deliberately kind of you know playful and evocative kind of fashion choices and in the west this is kind of known of and you see people like from gwen stefani to various writers and stuff kind of co-opting these kind of ideas it's so japanese and it's so different it's like well it's Sure, of course, there's quote unquote Japanese inputs into this cultural property, but there's also a lot of like the reality of highly urbanized populations. Otaku culture being the same way, um, video game handheld consoles being the same way. If if lots and lots of people are getting the train to work, then um, building the Game Boy makes sense as a business decision, right? Um, and it makes more sense than an adult Japanese man or woman playing the Game Boy on a train in 1987, where that wouldn't be in, in, in the United States, for example such things are associated with children. These elements of Japanese popular culture kind of changed as the years went on, particularly towards the end of the 1990s, beginning of the 2000s, you had this boom in Japanese cinema in the Western world and eventually American remakes um, of Japanese film, um, which again kind of has this odd, you know, either the West is looking at the J Japanese as an adaptation of their own ideas or as something inscrutably Japanese or uniquely Japanese. And it's the same old dynamics that have been going on kind of, you know, forever. Um, I think the key, you know, what I would encourage you to think about is, and this is where the links to the videos I'm putting on Moodle come in, is, is what kind of change are we seeing? How do we understand that change and how do we contextualize that change? Um, and in particular, you know, as historians, how do we do that by looking at the Japanese ingredients into this, uh, by looking at the Japanese kind of roots of these various kind of cultural practices? So for the discussion question, I've put a bunch of um, links up on Moodle and they're all um, advertisements on American television for Japanese products. And keeping in mind, of course, they're designed for American audience, often with American marketing people, of course, involved in the chain, but needing the final say-so 
of the Japanese kind of corporate leadership or the kind of Japanese creative leadership. Um, what kind of a Japan are we seeing produced? Pick one ad and, and, and tell me what kind of a Japan or, or what aspect of Japan or, or what absence of an aspect of Japan is present in this ad? And um, how, you know, how can we place that in trying to figure out a kind of a narrative of where Japan is in the world and in the American imagination in Japan itself throughout the 20th century? Thanks for watching.